Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Weird Shit. Uh, this time I'm going to talk about compositing a little bit and um, we'll talk about a few basic tricks that you can use to make your scene look a little bit better and uh, some things that I really like about the Blender compositor. Now before we get started, I have a little render here. It's fairly low sample count, but you'll see why in a minute. And a very simple scene, just some cubes, uh, a little dude over here, and it's very basic. But I wanted to show you some stuff that I find really interesting about the Blender Compositor. I'll go back into the UV image editor. So this is just the raw render. I haven't really changed anything. I just hit the render button and this is at 512 samples. So the first thing I'm going to do to start compositing is over here in the node editor, make sure that it's set to the um, compositing node tree and hit use nodes. So nothing changes, but we ha actually have our compositor over here and we can start doing some stuff. Now, Generally, there's a few, um, I guess, few filters that I use quite a lot. And the first one would be the glare filter. So adding glows and blooms and glares and all that kind of stuff to your image usually works really well to help sell the fact that certain parts of your image are actually lighting up. Now, as you can see, this is way over the top. And um, obviously, you know, this is just the default setting. I usually tend to use the fog glow and as you can see, it adds a lot to the image already. So by hitting M, we can see that you can turn the glow on and off. And there's a couple of controls here we can have a look at. Now, the medium setting or high setting, you can change it, but the high setting takes quite a long time to render. And I haven't really noticed much of a difference uh, between medium and high, except that medium is a little bit faster. Now, in some fringe cases, if you look at the image quite closely, you can see that uh, on a medium setting, you might get a little bit of artifacting here and there. But generally, this works fine for me. So there's a couple of settings here. The first one is the mix, where we can actually have just the glow if we set it to one, or just the original image if we set it to minus one. So this is a really nice way to control how much of the glow that you actually want. So by setting this to a negative value, um, we can sort of take the glow off a little bit, and this looks a little bit more natural. Again, I like to hit M a couple of times to see the difference in what we're actually doing. Now, another really important one here is the threshold. Bring down the threshold um, will basically make the darker parts of your image to start glowing. Um, we'll make them start glowing as well. But that can have some negative effects. As you can see, if I hit M now, it's brightening up my entire image. And I don't necessarily want to do that. I just want to do it for the brighter parts of the image. So on the threshold, you can actually control uh, this stuff. And you'll see that it goes up higher than one, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Setting this to whatever you need for your project, uh, it all depends on the image and the colors that you've rendered out. So this looks all right. And the last but not least is the size, and we can actually change the size of the glow. Now, you might notice that, you know, we have a size going ranging from six to nine, and that doesn't really say a lot. And I understand that a lot of people are coming over to Blender um, and having used other compositors like Natron or Fusion or Nuke or After Effects or whatever, you used to have like a pixel size. And this can be kind of annoying because there's only four steps and you don't really know how much you can do with it. Well, there's a few tricks that you can use to actually create your own plugin, I guess, a little bit um, by using multiple nodes and having a little bit more control. So for example, let's say I have a size that's like somewhere between eight and nine that I really like, but I don't have the fine grain control. Well, one of the things you could do is by setting this mix to one, we actually only get the glow. Then adding in a, where are we, a mix node, and setting this to add, we can do if we set the glare into the second slot and the image into the first slot, we get the same result as if our mix would be set to zero. Why? Because we're just grabbing the glow and we're grabbing just the glow, if we look at it again, and um, now we have it separated out and we can actually use a mix node to bring it back in. So, so far, not much has changed except that we control the intensity of the glow over here in the, uh, in the add node. So why would I do this? Well, as I was saying, I like the size somewhere between eight and nine in this fictional example. So what you could actually do is bring in a blur. Now this brings me to my second, um, second node that I use quite a lot. The blur is awesome. Uh, I usually set it to fast Gaussian because, well, it's got the word fast in it, so you can guess why I like using it. It's a lot quicker than the regular Gaussian, and once you get used to using this one, there's really not that much of a difference. 
Um, and then there's this really, really important checkbox that says relative. Now, what does this do? It changes your, um, your X and Y values basically to a percentage of the size of your image. So if I set this to like 10%, then you'll see it'll blur it out to about 10% the size of the image. Now, this is really hard to sort of um, gauge when you're starting with this. If I set the blur to 1% and I turn this off for a second, and you'll see it blurs it to about 1% the size of the image. Now again, most people are used to like pixel values. And at this point, you're probably wondering like, why is this relative stuff so important? Well, actually, this is considered sort of a preview render. Um, a lot of the work that I do, uh, especially for still images, is done at quite a high resolution, somewhere between 6 and 8K, sometimes 10K, sometimes even higher, depending on the project. So the cool thing about this, this relative compositing or calculated compositing, hey, hey um, is that if I were to render the same image twice the size or four times the size or a hundred times the size, it doesn't matter, our glows and our blurs will actually stay relatively the same size. So I'll bring up some images uh, at the end of this to show you exactly what that does. Now, the cool thing is this allows you to render in a low resolution image and a um, sort of low sample count very quickly to start compositing. And then once you're done with it, because this is all relative, you could actually just set it to a higher sample count, set it to a higher resolution, hit render, and it will look exactly the same, but in a larger resolution. So this is one of the things that I really, really like about the Blender Compositor. Um, is it a little slow sometimes? Yeah, but once you start learning how it works and uh, you start knowing which buttons to push and which things, I guess, uh, which nodes really slow it down and, and which ones don't, you can do a hell of a lot. So I'm gonna set this to, let's say like 5%. So now I actually have individual control over the size of the glow and I can even change it back here if I wanted to and bring this back a little bit again. And um, all I need to do now is just change the factor and there we go. You have perfect control over your glow and the cool thing is, like I said, it's resolution independent, which is really, really interesting. So maybe that's still a bit much, bring it back just a touch. All right, so what else can we do that's relative, that's pretty cool? Well, one of the things that I really like as well is using these mats. Let's say the ellipse mask. And uh, if I just hook this up by itself, you can see there's just the ellipse by itself. So let's say we want to create a vignette with this, which is really easy. Uh, again, I can just make the width a little bigger, um, make it a little higher, something like that maybe. And again, I'm gonna use another blur. Actually, I'm gonna duplicate this one because it's already set up the way I like it uh, with fast Gaussian and relative um, relative values. So let's say I blur this to like 50. As you can see, I'm getting sort of a white uh, middle. Maybe bring this up just a bit. There we go. And the corners are a little darker. So then we add in the color mix and we're gonna set this one to multiply. And there we go. We start getting a vignette already and we can add this in as much as we want. We can bring back the scale of it. So you want a vignette to sort of lead your eye to the middle of the image, but you don't want it to be super visible. Um, this is something that I see a lot with people when they're just starting out. Now this one's sort of definitely on the edge and it's still fairly visible. So I might bring down the factor a little bit. There we go. And what it does, if we turn this off, is you can see that it really highlights the middle of the image here. You're looking a lot more towards the image. You can play with that even a little bit more, bring down the Y value, so bring it down to the bottom. So the um, part of the image that's in focus is more sort of over here, and we have the little dude standing here, and he comes more into focus as well. So a vignette, rather than being sort of a standard effect that everybody uses because it looks cool, it's actually more of a tool um, to lead your eye to the place where you want people to look to. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, again, with a lot of effects, you, people tend to overdo it. But on the other hand, if you like a lot of glows or if you like a very heavy vignette, you know, go for it. I don't care. It's all good. Um, so that brings me to uh, a second portion of this uh, and the second reason why this is called calculated compositing. As you might have noticed, I've gotten to um, 
mixed notes here. And the one is set to add and the other one is set to multiply. And something I really want to um, talk about in this is that instead of looking at colors as colors, you should start looking at them as mathematics. Now, this might seem a little daunting to people because, um, you know, I'm not that great at math maths and I know, you know, a lot of people aren't really that into mathematics. But if you look at, look at colors as math, it becomes a lot easier. So what do I mean by that exactly? Well, generally, if we just uh, left click here and drag over our image, we get these values down at the bottom here. And you can see all of the darker values. And I'm going to look at the R, G, and B values over here. You can see we have, if I stop here, we have a value of R 0 0.02, G 0 0.01, B 0 0.01. So what does this mean exactly? Well, if you're used to working in something like Photoshop um, or Illustrator, then you're used to colors going from 0 to 255 in the red, green, and blue channels. If you've ever looked at this in Blender and wondered, like, why, why is this 0.2 or 0.1? Or, most colors sort of go from 0 to 1 somehow. Well, the reason for that is, if you look at colors differently, and if you look at black as 0 and white as 1, you have this really interesting way um, of doing things. because in compositing, if we look at some of the stuff that lights up here, you can actually see that on this one, the red value is 1.4, the green value is 6, and the blue value is 5.9. So what does that mean exactly? It means that we have pixels that can be whiter than white, and in the opposite direction, you can have pixels that can be blacker than black. So that means if I were to just grab a, um, let's see if I can find it here, something like an exposure, or an RGB curves. If I bring the white level up, for example, and I set the value to two, what this is going to do is it's going to compress all those colors down from zero to one. So now our black level is zero, but our white level is two. So that means that all of the stuff that's really bright has come down in color a little bit. And when we look at it now, it's being clamped down and we get different values. So that same thing that was like, one point whatever and then five and eight has now become 0 0.2, 0.3, 1 1.2 and 1 1.2 thereabouts. So that means you have a lot more information than you actually have in an 8-bit file in something like in Photoshop or in Illustrator. So that means you've got way more flexibility. Now this is sort of a technical tangent and if you don't really, um, if you're not really into that stuff, Fair enough, I understand. Uh, you, you can always ask me questions here on YouTube or on Twitter or whatever if you want more information. But the reason I wanted to talk about this is because now a lot of these blending modes, they start making a lot more sense. Because, you know, we have the traditional ones like linear light, soft light, burn, dodge, overlay, or whatever. But the ones that I actually use the most are basically add and multiply. Add and multiply, that's it. And subtract sometimes if I need it for something special. But the reason for it is if you think of these colors as math now, what we're doing is if I bring this in, this image, and we go look at the middle here, and I'm just gonna bring down the blur just a touch so we actually have a nice white middle, then you can see the colors at the bottom again are around 111, so almost pure white. So what does that mean? If we go over to the side here, and they're like 0 0.1, uh, 0, yeah, 0 0.01 uh, in you know R, G, and B channels because we're dealing with grayscale values, which means they're the same in the three channels. So, but what does that mean? Well, actually, when you think about it, if I use this multiply node and I plug it back in, basically what's happening is all of the middle is being multiplied by one. What happens if you multiply something by one? Nothing changes. But if you multiply something by 0.1, for example, well then the values will actually start going down. In this case, it means our colors are actually becoming darker. This is a really uh, important part of compositing to understand that once you start working in a compositor like Blenders or something like Nuke or Fusion or Natron or whatever, colors uh, internally actually handled with floating point mathematics. So the quicker you start thinking of colors as math, the more easier it becomes to um, sort of figure out how to put stuff in. So why do I add these glows on top? Well, I want stuff to be really light. I want to add to it. I want it to be brighter and brighter. I want to add brightness to it. So that's all it is. I have these values and you could actually see 
Um, if I bring this in, let's say we'll look at the uh, value over here, and it's like red is like 5.6 or whatever, five, yeah, 5.6. Let's look at it like that. And then uh, I'll look at the original image here, for example, and I believe this is this one, red is 7.1. So 5.6 and 7.1 is, you know, with a bit of quick math, is 12 and a half, 13 thereabouts. So if I bring this ad back in with just the, uh, um, the glow being added in, and I set this factor to one, we'll see that's exactly what's hap happening. If we look at the red value now, it's 12.8, so thereabouts. So it's actually adding these two values in. So this is the correct way to put in uh, a glow because something that glows, it's adding more light or I guess adding more brightness to your image. Now again, if I bring the factor down and um, I think it was like 0 0.05 or something like that. If I look at it now, the original value is seven. Uh, the new value is like 7.4. It's adding in a little bit, but it's uh, um, it mixes really nicely because you're adding in that glow. Same with the multiply we're multiplying it by a lower value than one, which means uh, it's actually darkening. And this is why a, an ellipse mask works really, really great because um, it's just a black and white mask. So values go from zero to one. Okay, so enough of the technical mumbo jumbo. Um, there's one or two more things that I really, really enjoy using as well. And most people will look at this render and go, that is way too noisy. There is no way you can use this. It looks absolutely god awful. Now, in still images, you usually have the time to just let it run for an hour or two hours or even longer. I mean, I've had renders that have run for 24 hours because they're like 10K and they're 4,000 4, samples and all that kind of stuff. But if you're working with animation, it can be really frustrating to have all this noise and just not be able to get rid of it, at least not in a time to get stuff rendered. Now. What is really important about stuff like noise? Um, a lot of artists will, for example, they'll render something out and they will add grain onto it later to make it look more filmic. Well, to me, that's sort of an extra step that seems a little stupid because we have this noise in our image. Why not use it to our advantage and actually turn our noise into film grain? Now, there's a very, very simple way of doing that. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it. And uh, there's this filter, and it's called the filter filter, which to me is just hilarious to start with. But the default setting of soften, um, if you set it to somewhere like 0.25 or 0.3, what you'll start noticing if I zoom back out is that this grain, all of a sudden, I hope it's visible on YouTube, rather than being really, really sharp, uh, this noise is sort of turning into film grain a little bit. Let's see if we go to 0.35. And you could, you know, push this as far as you want. And now this sort of thing is actually starting to look like film grain rather than um, digital rendered noise, which is really interesting because you can do a lot of cool stuff because now you could render at a lower sample count. Now, one thing that's super important if you're gonna do this and if you wanna use this to your advantage um, is if we go into our properties here and we go into our render settings, um, we have in sampling this little seed thing here. And generally, if I'm using this trick with the soften filter, I'm gonna turn the seed on to have a different seed value on every render. That means the noise will jump around a lot uh, from frame to frame. It'll look different from frame to frame. It'll give you a different noise pattern from frame to frame. But if you soften this out, uh, it actually looks like film grain and honestly, you'd be surprised how much you can get away with when you're doing this kind of thing. Um, you're creating the project, so you're looking at it the whole time. You're being extremely critical of it, and you sort of lose touch with the fact that a lot of people that are going to see your work, maybe they're just gonna only watch it once, maybe twice. Um, a lot of people on the internet, uh, if you're doing work that's being broadcast somewhere, or it's being uh, put up as an intro for someone, or anything really, is, it's only gonna be seen once by most people that pass it by. And a very small percentage of those will be 3D artists or you know, uh, people that are in the industry and, and are really critical of this stuff. So you know, if you can get away with this by rendering things on like 1000 samples or 500 samples and you know, just by using a filter after the fact, who cares, just go for it, it doesn't matter, it looks fine. 
Now, one thing that it does do, uh, unfortunately, and um, some people will, can argue with me on this for as long as they want, but it softens up your entire image. So you lose some sharpness, for example, in some of your edges. And uh, a lot of people sort of tend to look at this as uh, very bad practice and it's not, you know, it's not good. Your render doesn't look as clean or whatever. Well, I can tell you from experience, one of the most, um, I guess, telling things about CG, for example, I, I used to do a lot of VFX, is that uh, it's too sharp, it's too clean. And actually by using this soften filter, you're killing two birds with one stone. The, the noise that's still in your image will turn into sort of a film grain look, and the over sharpness of your CG image will, uh, will sort of go away and it will look more natural, especially when it's something animated. Um, again, you know, people can argue with me on this till they're blue in the face. Some people like really sharp images. I really like the look, uh, I really like the uh, the idea of having my artwork personally as something that people are looking at through a camera lens that has, you know, a little bit of imperfection. It's not 100% perfect. It's not always 100% sharp. Um, if you look at digital cameras nowadays, even really high-end digital cameras, if you really zoom into the image, it's not as sharp as some CG can be. So this is a really great way of getting around that. Now, I'm sorry if there's not a lot going on while I'm talking. Uh, these are just some things that I find really important that some people tend to skip over. And, you know, if you can use stuff to your advantage that generally isn't being used that way, then why not? It's a time saver. It's great. Um, so there's, I guess, one more big thing that I want to talk about, and that is how you can add extra lighting into your image after the fact. Now, this is totally fake. There's you know, uh, I'm not going to try and sell this as this is a really amazing technique. This is totally and completely fake, but it can look really nice if you do it right. So I'm going to move over my vignette a little bit here, and I'm actually going to copy these three nodes. And I'm stick these, oh, and I'm stick this in between our result here. And now we get a double vignette, but I want to start using this differently. So what I'm going to do first is actually set this over here. I'm going to change this up a little bit. Turn off the blur and talk about something else. So um, I'm going to set this to one and one. So this means our, uh, our glow is actually going to be in the top corner because this starts from the bottom left corner, X and Y zero. If I set these to zero, I'll show you exactly what I mean. So this is zero and it goes up to one on the Y axis and one on the X axis over here. So if you set this to one and one, then um, I've done this like a million times already. So I generally set my width and height fairly large and then I will unmute the blur here and bring it up quite a bit to like 80. Maybe bring this back down a little. What I'm looking for is just to create a really nice gradient. Now, if we're gonna add this back in, our image is still set to multiply, so it's actually darkening uh, this side of our image. But what I wanna do is set this to add, not mix, add, there we go. And if I bring the factor down quite a bit, you can actually have sort of extra light bleeding in from the top corner. Now, this is maybe a little bit over the top, but it's all just to illustrate what you can do with this stuff. And bring it back down. Maybe bring the blur in a little bit. There we go. Maybe bring the size in a little bit as well. And I'm holding down shift to uh, control these a little with a little more fine grain control here. So there we go. Turn it off and on again. And the whole point is that you don't see half of this stuff, that it's there, but it's just tricking your eye into things. Now, what do I like doing as well if I'm gonna add a, for example, color ramp in here? The other thing you can do is actually color this mist. So you can add sort of a nice little color wash over your image, um, which helps selling the effect a little bit. So just by doing some of these really, really basic things, and I mean, you could group these up and, and make these into little nodes that you can use, but I like doing it this way uh, to show you. If we go back to our original image, this is what it looks like. If we go back to our final image now, this looks way cooler. Anyway, in my mind it does. You might be saying, God, that's horrible. This guy has absolutely no taste and that's fine. Um, it's more about the techniques than anything else. Now, um, again, these are just a couple of simple techniques. I'll have the, uh, the Blender file 
done for you in, um, sorry, ready for download for you in the description of the YouTube video. And uh, I guess that's that. Now I'll finish um, by showing you a full render. Actually, I'll do that right now. Let me have a look really quickly if I can find them. They're still in here somewhere. Yes, I have a very messy, let's see, is it this one? All right, so this is a really nice example. I composited this one and hopefully this opens without crashing too much. So this is a 6,400 6, by 6,400 version of, or 6,500 6, by 6,500. And this is a 1280 by 1280 version. Now, what am I trying to show here? Except for the fact that this is on a lower sample count, I didn't change anything going from one composite into the other. All I did is up the resolution and up the sample count. And as you can see, this is a really huge image, and this is just the image that is the normal size. So, M, there we go. Um, what you can see is that the image is identical, except for the lower sample count, of course, but all the glows are the same size. All of the little bits and bobs that I use, I use like a sunbeams effect here. They're all the same size, and I didn't have to change it. So you can have a really nice quick compositing workflow where you render a very low resolution, low sample count version, composite the whole thing, make sure it looks good, and then just up the resolution, up the samples, hit the render button, go to bed, and the next day you have a finished image which, which looks exactly the same. Now to me, this is a really awesome workflow. Um, and I hope that this clarifies some of the reasons why I wanted to do this video because I think this is very unique um, to Blender in the way that it works and I really enjoy using it. I don't have to leave Blender to comp stuff and it's just a really cool workflow. So I'll have a, uh, I'll save this image as well, a 1K image and I'll render out a larger one as well for you to compare with and um, yeah, that's it, I guess, for me. Oh yeah, one last thing, uh, the, what is it? This one that I just showed you, if you have, uh, if you know what the Blender Cloud is, you can actually download this file together with some of the other ones that I did uh, and pull it apart yourself and have a look at it and have a look at some of the compositing that I did there. And um, yeah, that's it. So thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.